The Panzer I may be the start of that iconic line of German tanks, but it is no way the start of the story. We're familiar with the early steps, such as the A7V or the LK2, and then you hit the interwar gap. Now, during this period of time, a number of vehicles were played with, but the one most relevant to this story is the Klein tractor, the little tractor. In 1929, Krupp was asked to come up with a vehicle that could be used for reconnaissance, as a weapons carrier, or as a towing vehicle. It was decided that you could save a whole lot of time and effort by simply going to Carden Lloyd and purchasing one of their tractors. So, through a German front company, they purchased three of them from Vickers, arriving in 1932. Now, this is not to say that the suspension on the Klein tractor was a direct copy of that of the Carden Lloyd, but there was a lot of influence. For steering, they looked to the Cleveland Tractor Company, Cleetrack. Being as they were officially not combat vehicles of the Army, they were painted overall a single color gray, which was the standard color scheme for non-combat vehicles of the Army of the time. From 1933, Krupp is notified that it will receive orders for approximately 150 Klein tractors, codenamed Landwirtschaftliche Schleppers, agricultural tractors, also known as one series vehicles. Now, these are unarmored hulls, but they're certainly more than enough to get drivers schooled up on how to use these things. Armored superstructures were designed for later installation on top, but a variety of issues meant that the vast majority of Klein tractors never received them. So, enter the Series 2 Agricultural Tractor. One of which is sitting behind me here at Panzer Museum Munster. It is better known as the Panzerkampfwagen 1 Ausführung A or the SDKFZ 101. Although the Panzer 1 looked a lot like the 1 Series vehicles, pretty much every component was changed. The structure is of three components. You have the lower hull, you have the superstructure, and you have the turret. The armor is eight millimeters at 70 down here, goes up to 13 in the upper hull, and as much as 15 millimeters up on the turret front. The standard was to protect against 7.92 millimeter armor piercing at all ranges up to a 30 degree angle. So yes, this was designed to take fire. It wasn't purely a training vehicle, although in practice it was used as much to develop doctrine as it was in combat. But hey, both work. If you look at the components, we'll start off in the near side here. The Pioneer tools are found on both fenders. Three ton jack is located on the right. And you go forward a little bit, you get the horn by Bosch. Centrally mounted headlight, and the two towing points could not be mounted any lower because it was deemed that they would simply dig into the dirt. Front and center, you're going to see the access port for the steering system. Now, in early vehicles, this was 60 centimeters wide, but somewhere around the end of the 3 Series production, it was enlarged to 75 centimeters, and it stayed that way through Series 4 and later. Now, just to be clear on this, Series 2, 3, and 4 were all Panzer I Aus A. Series 5 and 6 were Ausführung B. And the difference in the two from the A and the B is more visible when you get around the back. The side of the vehicle shows off at the front of the sprocket wheel. Now, there was originally a brief dalliance with the concept of a rear sprocket drive, but of course, as you can see, they decided not to go with that. The suspension gets a tad complicated. For starters, there are three axles, which are basically rods which go the width of the vehicle. On axle number one is road wheel number one. Now, normally this will be different to all the other road wheels. It's made of silumen, and it had the reinforcing rib on the inside of the wheel. 
Now the later wheels originally didn't have this reinforcing rib, but it looks like they mounted it on this particular vehicle. It is mounted on a forward swinging arm on the axle here. It has got a coil spring and a hydraulic shock absorber. The whole system mounts with bolts in three places on top of the coils behind the shock absorber and then of course the main unit. On axle number two can be found road wheels two and three on a bogey. Mounted on the axle here, bracket comes forward and places road wheel two, also made of silicon, except normally without the reinforcing rib. The mounting point for the leaf spring is found here as well, and the axle or hub for the third road wheel is basically mounted directly to the leaf spring. So, should this part of the wheel hit an obstacle, the entire bracket will swing up, forcing the next wheel down, except of course it's got the leaf spring which forces it back up again. And then you move on to the next bogey. And so we come to axle number three. Road wheel number four is mounted in a similar manner to road wheel number three on the end of a leaf spring. Coming further back though, you're going to get the steel trailing idler, which is of course much bigger than the other vehicles and is the position point for your track tension system. In this case, simple enough, old fashioned screw. Oh, by the way, the leaf springs are an indicator also between an OUSF A and an OUSF B. On an A, they're mounted above the axle. On a B, they're mounted below. Axles two and three are of course connected by this U-shaped strengthening bar. Now all this is before you get to the track, which as you can see is supported on three return rollers. It is a skeletonized track system, 89 links per side, and the skeleton has some advantages when it comes to letting mud and dirt out of the system, and it reduces the chances of throwing the track, but on the other hand, it also reduces the effectiveness of the track in reducing ground pressure. The guide horns, which were part of the track links, often were hollowed out as well to again allow mud and such out. The pins are very simple. They have a head on one end. When you punch them through, they're simply held in place by this little cross pin, which is then hammered into uh, a little S bend to keep it in place. While we're down here, we can also see the row of bolts, which is used to hold the top half of the tank to the bottom half of the tank. All in all, the system would span a 1.4 meter trench, climb a 37 centimeter step, and ford a 60 centimeter depth of water. As we move to the upper superstructure, first thing I'll note is that the fenders have anti-slip shaping to them. Good call. The tanker bar design still hasn't changed across the countries in the decades and the stowage point for the antenna, which of course will pivot down and back. This reinforcing strip was added at some point later on in the vehicle's life. Not all of the vehicles did receive this strip, but the vast majority did. Finally, the viewing port at the back here indicates that this is one of the first 300 Panzer ones manufactured. Later ones didn't have it. Further identifiers at the back. Now, if you can see the trailing end of the running gear, well, look for the idler wheel. The trailing idler on the SA, this is replaced by a fifth road wheel and a raised regular idler wheel on the SB. This also required adding an 11 extra track lengths to the system. Fuel filler ports, there are two on the Series 2 and 3 vehicles. The fuel tank, as you can see, is directly underneath, a little bit of a distance down, so you gotta use a hose or a long funnel to fill up the 140 liters, which coincidentally would get this vehicle 140 kilometers. On Series 4 and later vehicles, there were four fuel filler ports, so there's an identifier there. Now, because the Aus A had a different engine to the Aus B, the entire engine deck also will look differently. So the grille on the SB is located off to the side. On the left-hand side is a longitudinal access hatch. On the house A, we have the two access hatches here for the two large air filters. Engines. Well, this is a four-cylinder. It is by Krupp, it's an M305. Puts out 
a whopping 60 horsepower. It is an air-cooled engine. Now you'll see us mounted traversely across the vehicle as opposed to longitudinally in the original tractors from Carden Lloyd. And the reason this was done was to leave room for the turret. Now there was during the engine selection process some debate in between whether or not they wanted a diesel engine or a petrol engine. Well, petrol or gasoline won for two reasons. Firstly, nothing else in the unit was going to use a diesel engine and the Germans reasonably enough did not want an additional logistical train just to power the tanks. And the other reason was that there was a thinking process that required that the tank put out the maximum possible horsepower for a series of engagements lasting over about five hours. Since the fuel capacity of the petrol engine was sufficient to last five hours and that the petrol engines at the time were a little bit better than the diesels in many respects, Petrol was chosen. Now, had that amount of time been elongated to say eight hours, well, there's an argument for the diesel after all. Now, when you move to the later vehicle, this starts the long association between Maybach and Panzers because the engine gets replaced by the 38 TR. This is a 3.8 liter water cooled six cylinder. And although the fuel tanks are only increased by six liters to 146, the better fuel efficiency of the more modern engine allowed the tank supposedly to go up to 170 kilometers. Max speed on the Ausfuhrung A variant is 37 and a half kilometers an hour forwards, 3.3 kilometers an hour to the rear. And lastly, while we're still looking at the back, I will note that the, you have the typical towing point at the bottom. And the final distinguisher between an A and a B is the fact that the A has the two exhaust pipes on the fenders, a B has a single exhaust running along the back. This brings us to an end of the tour of the exterior of the Panzer I. Yeah, now I get to see if I fit inside. Greetings lads and lasses. All right, for those of you that haven't yet figured it out, Inside the Chieftain's Hatch was conceived as an advertising mechanism for World of Tanks, the game. And, well, it's uh, about time to verify whether or not this is actually working for the bean counters. So I know a lot of you don't yet play the game. Well, here's the thing, it's free to play. And if you look in the text description down underneath the video here, you're going to see some instructions on how to access the game and attribute the game to uh, these videos and as I say it's free so give it a go download it look at the vehicles in the garage hit the tech tree in preview play a few games if you don't like it uninstall no harm done hasn't cost you a dime if you do like it well congratulations you found yourself a new time waster while you wait for part two of this vehicle to show up see you there Thirty-seven and a half, three point three. That's all I have to do. Oh, okay. Looking at 